Hello, I am John Clairbout. I regret I'm not with you all out there at MIT for this event. I'm sure I do know many of you out there, but there will be others out there whom I've never met, and so I better introduce myself. I was just about ready to graduate in physics in 1960 when I first met Ted. Since 1960 to 1962, I did my master's degree in earth sciences with Steve Simpson. Then I took a couple years off and I returned to do my PhD with Ted two and a half, hour, two and a half years and I finished with Ted in 1967. After leaving MIT I joined the faculty at Stanford University where I still teach one class and I have a few students. Those MIT memories are all about 50 years ago and I can hardly remember my own life that far back so I hope you will be satisfied with whatever memories of Ted I can pull out of the back of my head. My earliest days at MIT in geophysics, I remember Ted as a guy who talked about operational amplifiers. Operational amplifiers to build <laughs> voltage amplifiers at low frequency, low noise amplifiers. That got me thinking maybe geophysics would offer me some opportunity to make good use of signal analysis, which I had picked up. I never took a class on signal analysis, but I picked up some of it from a textbook of my roommate, who was a major in electrical engineering. So one day I told Ted that I had read an interesting book on geomorphology, and he informed me that that was the least scientific part of geophysics. But I do remember the department seminar at MIT, there were many very diverse disciplines in earth sciences were reflected in those seminars, and I was unfamiliar with just about all of them. But there was two people in the audience who always had a question or two for the speakers, and one of those was Ted, and the other was the chairman, Bob Schrock. In the very early days, I remember helping Sheila and Ted move all their furniture from one town to another. Now, why would that stick in my mind? Well, maybe it's because I remember Sheila telling me, you better be careful with my furniture. Don't bang it on the door frame on your way out. I guess I was kind of in a rush to get the job done. As I cast my eyes around the department taking those early classes, I remember some classes that were really very poor compared to the good quality classes we had in mathematics, physics, and electrical engineering. Well, those classes had textbooks. And I'm not going to, can't even remember the teachers that did a really lousy job, but I do remember Ted. And Ted was, was not a bad lecturer. He was just far from flamboyant, and he hadn't delivered those lectures a zillions of times as they had in some of these other fields. But it was really good material, valuable material, and I wish that his material had been in a textbook. Even if he had written it, I mean, yeah, would have been good. I should have saved some of those old project reports. Maybe I still have them on my bookshelf somewhere. I'm thinking about irreversible thermodynamics, streaming potential, and of course, basic electromagnetism and magnetotellurics. Talking about magnetotellurics reminds me that Ted had a student named Neil Delaney. Uh, Neil Delaney was... Uh, he was a student of Ted's and he was doing electromagnetism. And I was an enthusiastic hiker in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. So we got together. Neil was able to borrow the department van, which I'm going to show you a picture of. Yep, I think this is me. <laughs> and uh, and uh, <laughs> We went off to the White Mountains and we did magnetotellurics, which I was curious to learn about. And I particularly remember planting electrodes in the ground, in this hard ground, and maybe peeing on the electrodes to make sure they had some good conductivity, and stringing a long wire. I'm going to just guess it was a half a mile long. And measuring the voltage between those two uh, electrodes, which we'd planted, and seeing I don't know how many millivolts between them. So I was about that time I was finishing up my bachelor's thesis in physics. And so I told my physics professor about this, and he didn't believe it. The ground is a ground, you know, that's what it is in physics. But it gave me the opportunity to teach him a little bit about geophysics, that there's a, a return path inside the Earth. And we have this big loop, this big electric loop going between our wire and this return path deep inside the Earth. 
And because the Earth's magnetic field fluctuates, we have a voltage in this loop. <clears throat> well, I remember coming back from this trip with spools of paper. And I have no memory that we ever analyzed those spools of paper because basically we didn't have computers in those early days. Later on, I got them with Steve Simpson. Ted owned a VW bus identical in appearance to the one in this picture. I was an assistant Boy Scout leader in Cambridge. I wanted the Cambridge Boy Scouts to experience the joys of winter camping. Ted very generously loaned me his personal VW bus, which looked pretty much like this one, one weekend for that purpose of taking the Boy Scouts up to New Hampshire. Uh, that was very generous of him, I thought, and I also remember that the VW bus, the engine missed a lot. <laughs> uh, okay, maybe it needed new spark plugs, I don't know. Or maybe they, it got too warm. Anyway, years later, Ted got a big an award at SEG for his early work on magnetotellurics. And I remember in those days, there was some theoretician Ted knew at National Center for Atmospheric Research in Colorado. And this guy would publish long papers loaded with mathematics about the ionosphere. Well, we all know that when you make such theoretical papers, what you're basing it on is on the idea of layered shells, if, if not homogeneous shells. So, uh, but the real ionosphere is not layered shells, as Ted knew very well. The sunny side of the Earth's ionosphere is totally different than the night side of, of the uh, Earth's ionosphere. So instead of publishing long-winded theoretical articles, Ted had some way, which he had some way of modeling this ionosphere with maybe a dozen or two dozen, oh, maybe two dozen circuit elements, resistors and capacitors. I don't know if he had inductors in there too, he probably did. And these were mimicking Maxwell's equations on this, uh, on this real, realistic image uh, model of the uh, Earth's ionosphere. So one day I said something to to Ted that my dad had told me. My dad told me that his life was better than his dad's and mine was going to be better than his and so on into the future. My kids would be better than all of us. I don't know why I said that to Ted, but he was skeptical of it and I was taken aback by his lack of support for that idea. Now, of course, we know the future does hold many things for us to fear. Ted basically designed my thesis, my PhD thesis. He had the idea from the beginning. He told me how to build the equipment. I built the equipment. He had leased the phone lines, I don't know, 10 miles in each direction to hook it up. And, and he had his lab, his electronics guy build a recording equipment. And he knew how we were going to analyze this, roughly speaking. And I would have to say, in the end, we didn't see what we hoped to see. I wrote all the codes and I figured out the computer codes to analyze this stuff and I figured out why we didn't see it. And so that was, of course, a disappointment to me. But it, but it was not a disappointment to other people. They really wanted to know the answer to this question. So, And I really, really liked doing my thesis under TED. I, I think it was wonderful to have a thesis that goes from building equipment all the way down to analyzing it and discovering <laughs> discovering something isn't true. I'm not going to give you a long lecture about that. Well, it was interesting. Fascinating. Um, we could, um, I better not start talking about that. So Ted never paid much attention to publications. As a consequence, I didn't either. In my own PhD thesis, I eventually abstracted it and I left it in the proceedings of some conference, which is long forgotten. Uh, this, of course, is a mistake that no one like Frank Press would ever make. Okay, <laughs> well, they're different. I remember on one occasion, I must have been full of myself about how us MIT folk were better and smarter than other people. And Ted told me, and rightly so, that I was not being very polite. Was I too brash or was Ted too modest? Well, I, probably a little of each. Now, the, the, the last part of this story, oh, this is a good part of the story. Ted's desk was a sight to behold. The papers on it were about this thick, I believe. The whole, entire desk, the entire desk was full of about six inches of paper. 
And on it was mail that had been opened and mail that had not been opened. And he never seemed to touch any of it. And every once in a while, he'd have to sign a piece of paper like my thesis or something. So he'd pull out this sliding drawer and he'd have a little space that he could sign a piece of paper. So finally, <laughs> after that, I have one last story to tell you and a picture to show, which I should be bringing up right now, a picture to show of something that I stole from Ted Madden. I don't recall the exact circumstances, but one day I laid my eyes on this pencil. And I said, I must have that pencil. He doesn't need a little pencil like that. <laughs> well, you'll see it on the picture when I get that up here. That pencil has the name Teddy Madden on it. And I just had to have it. And so what would I do with a pencil like that but put it in my desk drawer? So I don't know how many offices I've been through at Stanford. I started as the low guy in the bottom of the totem pole in a small office. And I got a bigger and bigger office. At a certain stage of my life, I had the big corner office. And, I, and as I got older and older, I got a smaller office, smaller office. Now I'm, now I'm jammed in with three people. So every time I change office, I had to move. And so, you know, what happened. You get all these drawers. And, and I said, and so I, I thought I had this pencil somewhere uh, in my office. And then Jennifer phoned me and said, would I come to Boston to meet the rest of you guys about this uh, at this memorial service? And the first thing I did was tell her about this pencil. But then I realized I didn't know if I had the pencil. <laughs> oh, so then uh, I had to go and dig through 40 years, 45 years of 40, I don't know how many years of of old desk drawer stuff, but I'm, I'm pleased to report that I have the pencil and that Jennifer will be receiving uh, this wonderful uh, memento that I have of Ted Madden. Okay, so that's about all I can say about Ted. Um, all I can tell you is a little bit about me, what I'm doing lately, and I shouldn't spend much time doing that. If you can uh, spell my name, you can type... Uh, Learn about books, and you'll discover my free books on the internet. And uh, I've been uh, narrating book chapters. These are the five books I've written in my life. I've been narrating it recently. So if you want to see more of me, you've got this video narration of Clairbaut talking about one of his books. And I'm, I'm not going to pull up any chapter for you here. Uh, well, there was some pretty interesting stuff. Uh, so just go there and, and have a look at it if you like. So that's so long.